Hello, everybody. Welcome to Citizens for Global Solutions in Minnesota. I'm Katya. Citizens for Global Solutions in Minnesota is a nonprofit organization based in the state of Minnesota in the United States. Every third Thursday of every month, we host a global movies discussion. Tonight, exceptionally, we are hosting our also Human Rights Forum, where we will discuss the violence against women and around the world. Uh, if you want to learn more about CGS Minnesota work, please visit our website, www.globalsolutionsmn.org and follow us on Twitter and Facebook pages. Facebook page is Global Solutions MN. The Twitter is at CGS underline MN. And our YouTube, altogether CGS MN. Ladies and gentlemen, um, to speak with us tonight, we invited and are honored to host our guest speaker, my dear friend, Mubanga Kalima Mukwento. Mubanga is a Zambian storyteller and a lawyer by training. Mubanga graduated from Cavendish University, Zambia, and from the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. She practiced law in Zambia until 2019. Her first novel, The Morning Bird, Jacana Media won the Dinane Debut Fiction Award. The Morning Bird was also listed among the 15 most notable books of 2019 by the Brittle Paper. Later that year, she won the Kalemba Short Story Prize. She has been translated into Italian by Menelik and co wrote couple splits up while in lock lockdown, LOL. A short film that was anthologized on Netflix in 2020. She previously uh, have been shortlisted for the Bush Fellowship, Miles Moreland Scholarship, Nobro Short Story Prize, Bristol Short Story Prize and Fractured Lit Flash Fiction Prize. When she is not writing, Mubanga serves as a fiction editor for DOEC, associate, associate fiction editor for the Water Stone Review and mentor at the Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop. Mubanga uses her stories to illuminate the experiences of Zambian women where culture, class, politics, and access to justice intersect. This work earned her fellowships with the Young African Leadership Initiative Fellowship in 2017, the Hubert Humphrey Fulbright Fellowship in 2018, and the Voodoo Nout Summer Workshop to 2020, the Hawkinson Scholarship for the Peace and Justice in 2021, and the 1000 Voices Program, Every Woman Treaty in 2021-22. She is now a MFA candidate at Hamline University in Minneapolis, where she receives the Writer of Color Merit Scholarship Award and the Deborah Keenan Poetry Scholarship. In 2022, she was a semi-finalist for the Rolex Mentor and Protégé Arts Initiative. Obanga, it's a pleasure to have you here. The floor is all yours. Thanks for having me, Katya. Um, thank you again for that uh, generous introduction and welcome everyone from wherever you're watching. Uh, thank you for listening to me today. Um, I am a lawyer, yes, by training, and tonight's talk is centered around women's international human rights in times of crisis, uh, such as now, but I want to speak to you right now as a storyteller, starting with the story of a person whose life has had the strongest impression on mine. 
uh, I recognize that I am alive connecting with you about this specific issue because I cannot fully extract myself from the experiences of my mother who, although she died before she could tell this story herself, her flame did not completely die out. And today's talk is a small representation of her spark, something good uh, that was created out of a tragedy. Um, we have an hour together and 33 years, which is how long she lived, no matter how quietly lived, cannot be compressed into that short of a time. But my words will share part of her experience and mine. She is my starting point because she paid the ultimate price for gender-based violence during a pandemic. My mother, like 736 million women around the world now, that's almost one in three, was subjected to physical and intimate sexual partner violence for years before she met her death in 1998. That year, she became one of 900,000 women to die from AIDS. In life, my mother's passion was in teaching and through literature, she imprinted her mark on the next generation of Zambians, including myself. She taught me that in stories, one could learn, find and write the history of a people. It has been two decades since, and I have come into myself as a storyteller. And here is what I understand about the place of stories in history making. History textbooks are a heavily sanitized space. The place where, in the words of Chinua Achebe, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always, always glorify the hunter. In fiction and poetry, the home of the dreamers like myself, the truth can always come to peacefully exist. But today we're not talking fiction. Gender-based violence is a reality for girls and women around the world. Pandemics and other times of crisis heighten this because GBV reflects power inequalities in the world. And because imbalances are often tilted in favor of men, women tend to experience GBV more. But we know this. So my question is, how did we get here as a society? I say we are here because we forgot. We forgot the stories that told us, the ones that reminded us that we have been here before. Um, when I was in primary school, at the end of every lesson, we completed an exercise that was called, Can You Remember? It seemed arbitrary to us at the time, of course. Uh, we had places to be, like we had um, games to play, we had touch of lines to race to, and multitude of friends we wanted to play with. But we completed the exercises time and time again. Can you remember? Can you remember? After every lesson, every single day. And when the time came to be tested on what we had learned throughout the school year, we did not forget. In 2022, I know we are all zoomed out. We are just one unprecedented email away from slamming our computers closed and never opening them again. Except for that one hashtag, that clever tweet, right? That funny video and, and, and. So tonight I want us to carry out an exercise. This time I want us to do it together. Can you remember? Can you remember 1981? Can you remember the first time you heard HIV? Can you remember the first time you heard AIDS? Do you remember the pictures, the skeletons dressed as human? Now that it is no longer this knot around our collective necks, remember the price we paid as a society. In this age of pre-exposure prophylaxis, of readily available antiretroviral treatment, of people living long past medical predictions of life, when an HIV diagnosis has graduated beyond being a death sentence, in this age of seemingly endless access to information, can you remember? Um, can you remember Gia Karangi? Do you remember Elizabeth Glazer? Can you remember the stigma, the unvisited hospital rooms? Do you remember the terror? 
the not knowing how you could catch it, where you could catch it, who had it, how could you tell if they had it. Can you remember the unmarked graves and not having any end in sight? Because I can. And I believe we've been here before. Even now, when most information is available at the click of a finger, right? Millions of results responding to a single search within seconds. We're still a little bit terrified. And the internet is a very noisy place. So here we are. 40 years into that first unprecedented time when AIDS became an epidemic. Can you remember when governments did little to address that new disease because it was only affecting the ones that they didn't care about at the time? The gay men, the intravenous drug users, the immigrants and the racial minorities. Can you remember that it was only when HIV and AIDS activists, professionals and other people went public with their HIV status that the world slowly started to wake up? Can you remember that since the first confirmed case of AIDS, around 5,000 young women are infected with HIV on a weekly basis? Can you remember that in some regions, women like my mother who have experienced gender-based violence are nearly twice as likely to acquire HIV? 40 years can feel like a lifetime ago, I know. Some of us were not even alive when the AIDS crisis first became one. But 2020, that's within reach, right? How can it not? I mean, even this conversation that we're having right now, heard from screens in different places, would have been in a room where we could all see each other's faces. So of course we can remember a time before masks, right? Before contact tracing, before lockdowns, before toilet paper shortages and essential workers and flattening of curves before spikes and frontline workers and heroes before social distancing and remote learning, right? Before cities were in flames. But I still feel like we've been here before. Um, in this iteration, two years in, here's what we know. Uh, COVID-19 data shows that Black, African, Hispanic, Latino, American Indian, and Alaska Natives in the United States experience higher rates of COVID-19 related hospitalization and death compared to non-Hispanic white populations. It is now expected that COVID-19 will push an estimated 47 million additional women and girls into extreme poverty. And based on data from 16 countries, women have done 29% more childcare per week than men during the pandemic. According to survey results from 13 countries, nearly one and two women reported that they or someone they know have experienced violence since the start of this pandemic. So from epidemic to pandemic, the crisis that is gender-based violence is the unexpected and unwanted connection, intensifying what was already a violent experience for many women during, dare I say, uncertain times. In this pandemic, uh, UN Women is calling GBV the shadow pandemic, the one hiding behind the mask. Um, I want to invite you to consider the additional exposure that women now have to violence and their abuses when they're living in lockdowns um, with all mobility restrictions changing around the world. The economic uh, increased economic vulnerability that they're exposed to um, COVID-driven instabilities and how that can heighten the risk of child marriage in places, violence against women leaders. Um, right now, according to studies by CARE International, gender-based violence costs, and I'm talking about economic and not social costs, gender-based violence costs society an estimated 1.5 trillion US dollars. So if I break that down on a day-to-day -day level, these costs are borne by friends and family, by state and non-state institutions. And they are the cost of services like emergency healthcare, shelter and shelter homes, 
food and clothing in those homes, children, education, legal services, court services, counseling and other mental health care services, and other general costs of relocation and seeking refuge, right? And even to perpetrators, there is a cost. They pay costs and fines and legal fees. And that's not taking into account indirect costs of gender-based violence, like the loss of income for victims or even imprisonment for perpetrators that sometimes affects their families and their children. Um, there are children who see and absorb what is happening to their parents and caregivers. Uh, the children who grow up remembering like me and the ones who forget and are forgotten. And I'm casting this net wide because all of us belong in it somewhere and we have to find ourselves, we have to place ourselves within uh, these numbers that I've given in order to decide what we are going to do on a personal level to change those numbers. So when the next generation of storytellers put pen to paper, um, when our story is told another 40 years from now, let ours be one of dignity without the dehumanization that an AIDS diagnosis once brought, without the panic that we are now sometimes gripped with. Let us be remembered for caring, even if our demographic of people is not adversely affected by a COVID-19 positive test. And let us not wait for the activists, professionals, and other people to go public with their status in order for us to wake up. Let's not sit silent while women become collateral damage in this pandemic as they did in past moments of crisis. Because we already know that uh, even before COVID-19, one in three women experienced physical or sexual violence, mostly by an intimate partner. We know that emerging data shows an increase in domestic violence against women. We know that this violence includes sexual harassment and other forms of violence in the street and online. But this time in 2022, unlike times in the past when we've been faced with the world crisis, we have access to information like never before. And we can use that as our hope to create a different present and future. Um, because right now it still feels endless, right? With the updates, the mandates made and retracted, the vaccines and the boosters and, and, and. But we can still hope. And most of all, we can learn from our past. The cost of gender-based violence is highest right now when women are often stuck inside with their perpetrators, when hospitals are already strained. But in the end, all of us are going to pay. Um, I don't know who I'm talking to right now, where you are or where you place yourself in these numbers. But if you're a perpetrator of gender-based violence, this could cost you your freedom and your future. And if you're an observer and you're observing in silence, then that silence will cost you your conscience. If you're a citizen of the world, just baking banana bread on the other side of a Zoom call, uh, learning trending dances, the taxes will still reach you and you're going to pay for everything that gender-based violence costs a victim, the legal services, the shelters and everything else it costs to bring them back into the world. And if you're a victim, you know, this could cost you your life. And there may not be a daughter in 2046 telling your story. So the call to action for all of us is to stop right where we are, act from right where we are, speak and participate in conversations that shine the light on those who are doing the work to end violence against women in the best and in the worst of times. Um, that's what I have to say to you. That's wonderful. Thank you so very much, uh, Mubanga. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful story. I, I know a little more of you. Um, I know that you were a prosecutor in, uh, in Zambia before you came to the United States. And uh, I think if, if you could, 
uh, share with us some of your experience as a prosecutor, whether you were working in, and of course we know sometimes we don't have the choice, but uh, what was that um, the areas you were working more or specifically as a prosecutor, and if you had the opportunity to actually to face this topic of um, um, domestic violence and what is going on in Zambia, if you can give us a, a better idea, do women or better saying, uh, the, the justice hear women and um, help them or they are ignored as happens in so many places? Well, there's multiple layers to that question. Um, I worked in the high court. So sometimes the cases of gender-based violence that I encountered came at the worst stage when a murder had taken place. Um, that's when I would encounter it. And it was difficult to extract after the fact what happened, what led to that moment, um, regardless of who the accused person was and trying to figure out what the story behind it was. I think what tends to happen is um, the laws are there and generally people know what the laws are and what, who they can reach in order to protect them, but they, they don't have enough um, supportive services. Um, so it's easy enough to tell someone hey, go and report this case to the police and the police will take it to the prosecution authority and the prosecution authority will prosecute the accused, right? Um, but you know that, like I mentioned at the beginning that gender-based violence is tied to like power structures. So in Zambia, oftentimes that means economic structures and the abuser is often the one who's providing for the person who is abused and they don't have any other resources. So they have this conflict of, they know that something bad is happening to them and they have, you know, legally speaking access to justice, but their hands are tied um, to the extent that if they, do take this person to court and they proceed to testify against them. And if the best case scenario for the law, that person is imprisoned or given the whatever appropriate punishment for the extent of their abuse, then what then they have they are stuck economically. They don't have the resources that they had before. You know what I mean? So there's that conversation too. I think. Yes, Nancy unmute myself. Thank you, Mabunga. Um, various things come to mind, but if I'm right, you said that one in two women experience violence and that this was pre-pandemic? Yes. So I'm wondering, is that in a lifetime, how is violence described? And is that a statistic for the United States or globally? That's a that's kind of a shocking um, statistic. <laughs> so I, I wondered if you could you know, expand a little bit more on precisely what that means. That's a global statistic. Um, and I can send you a resource um, later, but that's um, a, a statistic that I found on UN women. That's a global statistics. One and three women have experienced physical or sexual violence in their lifetime. Um, that it doesn't go into detail as far as, did you only experience it once or how many times? But um, that at the time of the survey, um, that many women had experienced um, some form of gender-based violence. And you know it covers a wide range of abuses. Um, some, a lot of the time when people think about gender-based violence, they think about the physical, right? But it can be economic, it can be um, psychological, it can be emotional, it can be verbal. Um, but this particular statistic was talking about physical and sexual violence. Wow. Well. Mm -hmm. In other words, if um, if uh, you didn't go through any violence, a woman that you know did. Mm. Yes. Or more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. So yeah, it is a shocking statistic when you encounter it for the first time. Um, but I, I maybe because I've done a lot of like ground level work with women who are experiencing violence, it has stopped shocking me 
as much. So I, I think more about like, how do we have these conversations and how do more people know and figure out what their role is in, in, in those numbers, you know? Thank you. Do we have other questions from the audience? Uh, Fran is asking a question, Mubanga, and it's in the chat. Is there a yeah. comparable stat for men? I didn't look up a comparable stat for men, no. I'm sure there is, but I didn't look it up. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Marion. Yeah, I want to know um, from your experience and from all the research that you've done, when we look at where in on this earth, which country with, with what areas are are having more of this gender-based violence taking place in? I, I look at I look at the Middle East, I look at Afghanistan right now particularly, I look at Iran right now, I look at it, it it's actually, you know, quite prevalent even in the U.S. when you look at the people here and depending on the south or the north or the east or the west, it's it, different locations have different percentages. It, is there any, um, any kind of logic behind what, what is, what is the root cause uh, and how does, how do we deal with it? How do we address it? Because the, the band-aid jobs that everybody's been doing is not getting us anywhere. Like yeah. Perspective on that. Yeah, first of all, I, I don't think it matters where in the world you live. Women all over the world experience GBV. And when I last looked it up, statistically, I think the US was um, number six because some other countries were also tied. So regardless of where you live, you're at risk of um, being a victim of gender-based violence, right? Um, as far as what, uh, like what's the root cause, there's so many things that you can say, but I do think what a lot of people who study gender-based violence agree on is that because we can see that women are disproportionately affected by it, that they're the ones who are most um, victimized, in this context, we know that it's fueled, a large part of it is fueled by inequitable gender norms um, and this imbalance of, of power. And we know that it's rooted in that sort of like economic and financial and, and multiple other um, inequalities between men and women. Solutions, we can have a long-term conversation about solutions. And I think it depends um, where you're doing the work, right? Um, a lot of people argue that um, laws are the answer. And what I have to say about that is that laws are the starting point. Um, there are a lot of places that don't have specific legislation protecting women from gender-based violence. And we don't have a global treaty right now that specifically mentions violence against women. Um, but there are many countries, um, Zambia included, that has an anti-gender-based violence act that covers a wide range of abuses, not just physical and sexual. It includes economic um, and uh, verbal and emotional abuses. Um, but I think it's it starts on a conversational level, and that's why I, when I was having when I was preparing what I was going to say today, you know, I could have come and given you a list of facts alone, and I could have given you a list of like play, you know what laws exist in this country and this country and this country. But I think the the baseline of it is that the conversations around it are not being had, and that's why when someone gives you a figure like one in three women or one in two women are, are likely to have experienced um, gender gender-based violence at some point in their lives, it's shocking. It's because women themselves don't talk about it. And so there's 
there's sort of like the culture, there's, a, there's an open secret and an open secret is still a secret, right? There's a, there's a culture of silence around it. So first of all, we need to start having the conversations and we also need to start having the conversations early, right? Because when you talk about inequitable gender norms, you're talking about the, the, the ideas, the social expectations that the genders, um, wherever they live, expect from the other person. And if, 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 if one gender is disproportionately um, uh, placed in a position where they don't have enough power control over their own existence, then they're more likely to be victimized, right? So wide ra what I'm saying is wide range of solutions are available, um, starting with um, conversations, because conversations challenge um, culture. Um, because a, a big excuse for gender-based violence in a lot of places is, is cultures, right? Is, is oh, the, we, only, we do things this way, um, so we'll continue to do things this way, regardless of what the consequences are. Um, yeah, does that help? Does that respond to what you were asking? It, it, it helps. It almost feels like we need to go back as women mm -hmm. and not only bring our, our daughters up with a different mindset, with the mm -hmm. strong Amazonian mindset, but also we need to teach our boys uh, mm -hmm. to be compassionate and loving and not be egotistical uh, mama's boys um, and and turn them into these nutcases that are, that are around us. I'm sorry, but mm -hmm. I see so many of them. And it, it seems like even uh, fixing this problem would be in the hands of the mothers. I'm sorry, I didn't get the last part of what you said. I said, even the solution to this problem, the mm. education part of it, or the, the part of how we bring up and what we teach our children mm. over and above culture, mm. it still comes back to the mother and how the mother is bringing up their children. Why the mother? Well, because I, I see more mothers being involved in their children's lives and and how they they have more power in impacting their children's lives many a times most often at least i see fathers being absent so you know men just don't seem to be available i would argue that that's part of the problem that even in a conversation where we're talking about um, in, a, in, in equal power balances between men and women, um, mm -hmm. poor, poor behavior from children when they're adults and poor behavior from men is still blamed on their mother, even though parenting should be, you know, ideally, if, if, if a child has a mother and a father, then both parents um, should bear responsibility of raising that child. Just yeah. like if, if a parent had two mothers, you wouldn't pick one mother to to be the one to right. bear the burden and if a child has two fathers you won't say okay this father is the one responsible for teaching this child how they should behave in the world right um so that's also included in the conversation um you know it's 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 not a mother's fault um if, if no, a I'm child not saying it's a mother's fault. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in no way saying that uh, you're absolutely right um, you're absolutely correct. It seems I just was wondering if, since we can't get through to men, at least not many of them, uh, maybe part of the solution is how the mothers bring up their children. Uh, and, and if they can teach their children to have more of a heart and uh, to, to feel more. Uh, maybe this wouldn't happen, particularly um, for the boys. Because I don't see that many men making that kind of an effort. It's true. I don't see many men making that much of an effort. So I would say maybe part of the solution is holding men accountable to being parents as much as we hold women accountable to being parents. Oh, absolutely. I mm -hmm. believe even on reproductive rights. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's, it's all about the woman having the abortion. It's about the man not being able to control his dick. And if he can't control it, he should cut it off. 
that okay. the women don't have to have uh, abortion. I'm I'm sorry. I'm that's a hot point for me. I don't. I am sick and tired of women being put in this position. It looked like Fran was reacting and maybe has a comment. Did you want to share? You're muted. There I am. I guess I, I don't react well to, I, I didn't react well to, to what's the effect of the mom's behavior or the mom's upbringing. I, I think a huge piece these days is the social media, the, the things which are coming out, not just on television, but the games, the, I, it's, it's very hard for kids to have modeling outside of the home. They, they can have wonderful modeling from a, both parents or one parent um, and just be surrounded in the rest of, of their world with aggression and battles. And I, I'm just thinking of a lot of the, the video games and the, the type of movies and things that are, that are out. Well, I would just say I have a son, I have a husband. <laughs> and just in that dynamic, I think it's not only me as the mother, certainly it's not just what we say, it's more how we live anyway, right? As parents, since we're getting into parenting, kids watch our, their parents' backs is sort of a, a saying, right? So, I mean, whatever we say, but it's how we live. And I think it's the dynamic of a male partner who really respects the woman and models how women should be treated. And then the woman being someone who's very empowered and living their life in a way that's, you know, fully realizing themselves. So um, I, I really appreciate Mariam bringing up how important the family is. Um, but I do think that um, men are, whether they are around, whether they're absent or not, whether they're around or not, the reality is how they are does also affect by osmosis, the self image that, men, that these boys and girls have as they're growing up. Yes, and we as a society also have um, um, a role in everything, in the education because, um, it's uh, interesting, we have, um, we see that happens when the kids are good and everything is going well. Oh, but their parents did such a great job. If something happens, minimal that it is, it's the, fault, the mother's fault. So we need to also stop criticizing mothers. So I have so many uh, wonderful friends women that are mod mothers and it's it's so much burden and weight regarding the criticism that they receive from the society and uh, i i agree with you mubanga that um it, you know it's obligation of both parents and at the same time when something that happens it's good or bad it's both responsibilities. And I think it's, it depends on us to educate our kids uh, well. At one point, the generations are um, improving in a way that they learned better how to behave and respect their sisters, their mothers, their wives, their girlfriends, their friends who are female and other people who share the houses, the, the, same, um, the same household, um, that perhaps um, next generation will live with less uh, problems than our current generation. I, I do believe that there are not only, there is not only one problem, but I think it's a, it's a broad, um, broad problem that we have right now. I wanted uh, uh, William sent a, um, a question, and then after him, we are going to Gail. So William's question is, 
Will you please talk about your book, The Morning Bird? Is it a fiction perhaps based on uh, actually experiences? Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Um, the Morning Bird is a fictional text. It's a novel about uh, a family that unravels. And it's told from the point of view of a girl, her name is Chimoka. And as a result of this unraveling of her family, she becomes homeless and navigates 1990s Lusaka, mostly by herself, but also with her friends and her brother. And it's not based on my experiences, but it's rooted in a reality for many children. Um, specifically the increase in the number of homeless children in the 1990s as a result of the AIDS crisis in Zambia and how the extended family as it was then failed to absorb so many AIDS orphans because it happened so quickly um, and we didn't have a plan, so. Thank you. Gail, you have a question? Please unmute yourself. Um, Gail, you are uh, on mute. If Here we you go. can, yes. Um, I had trouble unmuting. Yeah, I wanted to mention that I visited Zambia. Um, I went from Southern Africa to uh, as far North as Egypt and back. And so went through Zambia a couple of times in 1971, it would have been, and had a lovely time there. Um, it was maybe the first place that it really struck me um, how different a worldview um, people can have being in a different country, a, a global South country, perhaps especially. Um, I met a man there, I, I was referred to him, Mr. Tabata, he was in his 80s in Lusaka, who talked to me about the um, assassination of President Kennedy, got me to question the official story of, of that assassination. And I, I'd never um, thought of that before. So now I'm questioning the official stories of lots of things. But, um, Anyway, I was thinking um, it would be useful. I don't know if the data that you have is broken down into, you mentioned different kinds of violence, some being much more severe than others. I mean, for example, rape would be, um, murder would be the worst, followed by rape, followed by, you know, some things are um, not as severe. And I, I'd be interested if there data, if there's data for, you gave the example of, like the sort of abuse during lockdowns. I think of that as being more um, maybe women getting getting beaten up and verbal abuse and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and I was wondering if the if there's data that's um, categorized available. Okay, um, as far as um, data on women during lockdowns, I think that's ongoing data, right? That's research that's ongoing and people are publishing papers on it every day. Um, the breakdown of statistics is definitely available um, everywhere online. I tried to just limit it to what I was going to talk about today, um, mm -hmm. but the UN does update regularly um, and uh, breaks it down into the kind of uh, violences that women are experiencing. And it's based, I think it's it's dependent on like how frequently they're being reported and also how frequently those countries are updating they, their um, reports on these specific violences. Thanks. Yeah. Also, um, 1971 Zambia is a bit before my time. Yes, I, I, I sure. didn't, I didn't yeah. live in, in that Lusaka, so. <laughs> we have other questions. And you need to, I, I always think about, um, 
what is going on in the, in the exactly exact moment where we are talking. And just as an example, so we have this uh, conversation ongoing, and of course, it's, it's recorded and eventually people will be watching on YouTube. And um, there are many more women than men in this conversation, which is interesting because kind of gives an impression that it's uh, a women's interest. And I do think that should be taken seriously by, by all genders. Don't you agree, Munga, Mubanga? Yes. Yes, period. Uh, yes. Someone, someone period. named Twambo Mushipwe is in the waiting room and it says joining, but having trouble joining, I think. Uh, sorry, I just thought that might be a friend of yours that you. <laughs> yeah, she's to. joining from Zambia. Okay. Do you have other questions? Well, I, you know, CEDA, right? Let's see. Mm -hmm. You probably know what that, <laughs> what that stands for. Um, mm -hmm. And the U.S. has not, is one of the few countries that hasn't signed. Famously so. Yeah. <laughs> and what I gather is that it's um, conservative politicians who are against it and either saying it's not necessary or they don't need some international body telling them how they should treat women. <laughs> um, anyway, can you speak to that? Do you know much about it? And would, would um, a push to ratify that be something that would be helpful in a solution? Well, CEDA is on the elimination of discrimination against women, right? And the framework of that works in the context of discrimination. Um, so it's useful and was the first document that specifically addresses uh, women's international human rights in that context. Um, but it doesn't mention violence. It doesn't specifically mention gender-based violence. Okay. So a lot of organizations that are calling for a new treaty are calling for a treaty that specifically addresses violence against women right because remember when I said um, and even an open secret is a secret so just mentioning just saying discrimination is not enough right because we all know that violence against women has existed for generations so if we want to address it the way we address other injustices on a global scale why wouldn't we mention it specifically why wouldn't we say okay Here's a, um, a global treaty. Everyone is agreeing that this is our position on gender-based violence and specifically gender-based violence as it affects women. Um, I can't speak to why the U.S. hasn't, um, you know, uh, signed on to uh, CEDAW, uh, if that's what you're asking. Is that what you're asking? That was part of what you, you addressed also what, what I was getting at. Okay. Um, yeah. That those are my thoughts on CEDAW. I think it's a it's a great document. I think it's a good um, starting point. But I've also written in other places about, you know, sort of the inadequacies of the law in addressing um, violence against women. How, um, especially, and I was in 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 that paper. I was talking about Zambia in particular. I was talking about how. Uh, Zambia has a dual legal system. Um, it operates with um, what it absorbed uh, post-colonialism, and it also has um, uh, uh, traditional laws that differ from place to place um, because Zambia has over 72 different tribes. Um, mm -hmm. They are spread out across the country. So, um, you know, the, the different subcontexts can change depending on where you are. Um, so in that paper, I was talking about how global treaties are important and laws are important and uh, setting boundaries across the world are important, but to also have those conversations, make sure that they are trickling down to the people that they are meant to be legislating and that you're giving them sort of input um, to, to be able to sort of, you know, uh, break it down to where it's, it's, it's meant to exist. Since you were mentioning about uh, Zambia, would you give us um, uh, an idea of uh, whatever topics you, you, you choose, uh, but how 
how are the, the human rights protections or violations going in, in Zambia in any area that you choose to talk about? Is, is that a country that respects human rights or more or less, or it's an average? I don't feel comfortable giving like an off the cuff answer on like, does Zambia protect human rights? Because I think that's something which like, I need to come to you with the basis of like, this, these are the reports we have from say last year. And this is what Zambia is saying happened in the last year. You know what I mean? Um, what I will tell you um, in relation to what I was talking about today, I was talking about gender-based violence. I will tell you that Zambia did sign on to CEDA. And in addition to signing on to CEDA, we um, have the Anti-GBV Act, which a lot of countries around the world don't have. And we enacted ours in 2011. And um, national um, non-governmental organizations have been a big part in um, spreading the word on what the Anti-Gender Based Violence Act does and how to use it to rural communities around Zambia. So in the context of anti-gender based violence work and anti-gender based violence language, even though the world doesn't have a treaty that specifically addresses violence against women, Zambia does have a law that works um, hand in hand with um, existing criminal laws and existing criminal procedure laws. So everything goes like here, goes to a ju judiciary eventually. And when, so do you have a good judiciary? Can, can the people count on the judiciary to be fair? And, and treat people with um, equality and justice? Generally, I would say yes. Um, because when you talk about uh, gender-based violence in particular, when it, in the context of like uh, human rights laws, that's like a person-to-person -person, um, kind of interaction. It's not like state-to-person, right? It's not like other human rights violations that can sometimes be, um, uh, like from state to person. Gender-based violence is typically from person to person. So when you're going to seek justice, the judiciary has no interest in protecting one person over the other. The judiciary's interest is in ensuring justice, right? And so I would say yes. Good. Do you have other questions? Uh, there is one question um, from the audience. How did these laws come to be? What will it take to have them everywhere? Um, are you talking about the Anti-Gender Based Violence Act as a law? The, the laws in, in Zambia that, you're, that you have that protect the women, uh, I wanted to know what what brought on to establish these laws, and if there is a way that we can have such laws uh, everywhere. Okay. As a part um, of human rights. Yeah, so every country has its own framework. Um, Zambia's laws are formulated by a parliament, um, and the members of parliament are elected uh, during elections at the same time as the presidential elections, and so they represent different parts of the country. And the way lobbies, uh, the way um, laws are set forward is through lobbying, and the lobbying is done at various levels. A lot of the time, it's um, uh, non-governmental organizations. Um, in two thousand and 13, the organization that I worked for was um, Women in Law in Southern Africa, which was a big part of lobbying for the Anti-Gender Based Violence Act in Zambia, insisting that we needed a separate piece of legislation um, outside of the Criminal Procedure Code and the Penal Code Act. Um, so it's about looking at each country's framework and who is responsible for enacting laws in that country, and then lobbying the people that are responsible for enacting laws in that country and pushing for it until it um, is put to paper. 
Does that answer your question, Mary? Yes, it does. Thank you. Gail. Um, I'm just wondering if you could uh, say something about Zambia, a kind of the status of Zambia now. Um, what are things like? Is it peaceful um, or not? And what is the kind of quality of life there? Those kinds of things. That's a big question. Um, <laughs> is it peaceful, the quality of life? Um, it's peaceful. It, it, do you mean, when you talk about peace, you're talking about peace versus war, right? Right. I mean, in Somalia, for example, there's um, still a lot of, um, you know, civil war type things going on. But um, Well, demographically, you know that Somalia is very far from Zambia. Right, it's, right. It's, it's more in the east, in, on the eastern region of the continent than um, the central southern region, which is where Zambia is. Um, and Zambia has never had war. So Zambia has always been at peace. We've never had a civil war and we've never been at war with any other country um, in the region or otherwise. Um, as far as um, the status of life, um, I can provide you with the latest information on um, statistics on what's going on in Zambia right now. Are you asking about gender-based violence in particular, or are you asking about another area of interest? Um, well, I'm asking about, you know, um, I think I'd heard that there was um, hyperinflation or something, economic stress going on there. That was a while ago though, so I don't know. Um, like, are, are people really struggling or not economically? I don't feel comfortable responding to like the economic position of Zambia because that's not something that I've uh, read deeply enough into. Um, and I, I haven't lived in Zambia for a few years. So that would be like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's something that you can look up for sure. Um, and you'll be able to find multitudes of resources as far as like, where is Zambia economically right now? Um, but it's, it's, it's not something that I feel comfortable just answering off the cuff like that. Like, this is the status of Zambian people economically. Mm -hmm. What okay. about the Zambian women? What about what? The status of women, are they... Um... Are they in better position now to, to have um, more control over their lives and uh, have a better life? As compared to when? As compared to 20 or 30 years ago. Okay, as compared to 20 or 30 years ago. Um, let's go back to what I was talking about before, right? Um, in terms, so what I, what I am seeing is that um, it's been sort of up and down in terms of um, the GBV cases. Some years um, it looks like we have an upward swing and some years it looks like we have a downward swing. And I haven't seen research on whether the connection is that more cases are being reported now than before we had an anti-GBV act or that more cases are, be are just happening now. Than, than they were before. Um, if you're talking about uh, the status of women generally, I can talk to you about what I remember from my memory. I remember um, that when I was growing up, there was a nationwide campaign um, to ensure that girls were um, being enrolled in school and being kept in school. I remember that there was a time when girls who fell pregnant while they were still in school, and by school, I mean up to grade 12, which is at the end of high school here, they would have to withdraw. Um, but that no longer is the case. Um, girls have, have to stay enrolled in, in school, whether they fall pregnant or not, right? I know that in, in my lifetime, um, education has become free. I don't know to what um, grade level now, um, but when I was in Zambia, education was free from grade one to grade seven, which it, it wasn't always that way. And I also know that um, last year we elected our first, no, last year we elected our second 
um, female vice president of the country. Wow, so you're ahead of the US. We are. Hallelujah. <laughs> Guess both countries are ahead of US. Thank you for that. Okay, do we have any other questions? All right. Well, everybody, on behalf of uh, CGS Minnesota, I want to thank you all for attending this event. If you want to watch again, the recording can be found on our website and our YouTube channel, along with resources to help. CGS Minnesota hosts event, uh, events every month. Please visit our website and learn what the next events are. If you want to make a difference and you want to know how you can assist, please contact us at www.globalsolutionsmn.org or send an email to cgsmn.contact at gmail.com. Thank you, Mubanga, for accepting our invitation and for sharing with us the facts and the situation about the gender-based violence in Zambia and in the world. We appreciate you, your knowledge, and you sharing your knowledge with you. And I also want to thank everybody who attended. And I, let me make a, a special thank you to the man who uh, attended. And it's so important that uh, everybody understand that this is um, uh, a group effort. Thank you, everybody. And I hope to see you again very soon. Have all a good night. <laughs>